Hello and welcome to our latest Hangout on Air, this one for April. My name is Amanda Moore and I'm the Director of Online Content and Communities at the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law. Um, I'm happy today that we have two very interesting guests with us. We have Peggy Stevenson, who's the Director of the Record Clearance Project at San Jose State University. And she's uh, joining us today from San Jose, California. And she also is the author of our April Clearinghouse article, which is called Expungement, A Gateway to Work. Hello, Peggy. Hey, Amanda. Hi, everybody. There we go. Let's get you on screen. Hi, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> Hi. Hello, everyone. Hey, and we have another guest with us too. We have Rochelle Rotea, who is a senior at San Jose State, and she's been involved with the Record Clearance Project for three semesters. I'm happy to say that she is graduating next month and will be attending law school at UC Irvine. So congratulations on that, and thanks for joining us, Rochelle. Hi, everyone. Hello from sunny California. Yes, I should say Rochelle's joining us from Menlo Park. So. Um, and I'm in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which today is sunny. Um, it's not California, but we do what we can. Um, before we get started talking to Peggy and Rochelle about the really great work that they do in California, um, I want to address a couple of housekeeping matters for those of you who are tuned in. There are two ways that you could be watching us right now. One is through the actual Google Hangout. Um, if you're doing that, you can submit questions to us through the Q&A app, and we really encourage you to do that. Um, these Hangouts are a chance for you to get to talk to people who are doing interesting work, who write articles for Clearinghouse, um, and ask them about their work and um, about those articles. You can find the Q&A app if you hover over the left side of your screen. Um, you'll see a bunch of icons pop up. One of those is blue, and it says Q&A. You can click on that, and then you'll have a box pop up on the right side of your screen. Um, where you can submit questions. So if you want to go ahead and test it out, just send your name and where you're watching. Um, that'd be great. Just make sure that's working for you. I know that others of you are um, watching a live stream of this Hangout through the Shriver Seniors YouTube channel. Um, if you're doing that, we still want to hear from you. Um, you can't submit questions through the Q&A app, but you can submit questions to us through Twitter. Um, so you can use the Shriver Center's Twitter handle, which is at Shriver Center. And um, if you also want to just Tweet at us right now and let us know you're out there. That would be great. Okay, I don't want to wait any longer to get to um, our guests. So, um, as you saw when you registered for this Hangout, we're going to be talking about um, criminal records and expunging those criminal records and what that process is like and what it means for the clients. So, I just want to start out by giving everyone an overview of what your project is, the, the record clearance project. So, Peggy, could you just tell us what that is? Sure, I'd be happy to. First, I just want to say thank you, Amanda, for all the wonderful help that you and other members of the Schreiber Center have uh, provided in getting the article to fruition and for setting up this opportunity to talk about expungement. So thanks very much. Um, and, and I guess that by background, I should say by expungement, I mean sort of it's a general term referring to how to make somebody's criminal conviction history the best that it can be or the cleanest that it can be under the varying state laws. So in some states, that means uh, reducing felonies to misdemeanors. In some states, people are able to dismiss convictions. Some states offer certificates of rehabilitation, um, just varying ways of making a person um, record, uh, be behind them and giving them the chance to move forward. Uh, we're very fortunate in California of having um, some particularly effective, I think, expungement laws. And um, it's, it's great to be able to have that on the books. The issue is for so many of our clients, the remedies that are available are pretty much unknown to them. And that's because for so often it has been um, required to have a significant amount of money. We've heard from one of our clients that it cost his friend $15,000 to pay an attorney to uh, get his expungement uh, done in court. So what our office is doing and what we're, we're staffed by students, we're at, at uh, San Jose State, as you mentioned, staffed by undergraduates, 
uh, like Rochelle and, and some of her wonderful colleagues. Um, what we do is we assist people in uh, learning about the law and then taking advantage of using the provisions that ordinarily they wouldn't be able to access in order to move forward with their lives. So the main ways that we do that is we start out uh, generally by giving community education presentations on expungement law and procedure. We also have one-on-one uh, -on -one drop-in advice sessions where people bring a copy of their criminal history report and um, in an afternoon, we run these about five times a year, have a sense of what their next steps are towards expungement, what their eligibility is, and um, how to proceed. And then finally, the third thing that we do is we uh, are able to assist a relatively, unfortunately, small number of clients, but um, 240 so far, um, in going to court, preparing their petitions, and presenting their cases to a judge. Uh, and so that is, of course, the, the effective way. That's the remedy for people to get their records cleared to the extent possible. We have a, a, a fourth pro project that we've started relatively recently, and that's our mentoring program. In the mentoring program, we've hired uh, three of our former clients to uh, assist as mentors to people as they are released from jail. And our students are involved in that process as well as sort of support people to the mentors as the mentors guide from their own experience and their own training uh, people as they're released from jail to get ready pre-expungement so that at, at the time that they become eligible they can then file their petitions and, and be ready to go right away. Well that's great. So the four four main parts of the record clearance project then do the community education, the drop-in sessions, representing clients and then the mentoring program. Did I ca catch all those? That's right. You got it. Great. So that's a really complex, comprehensive also program. Um, I want to ask you a question just a second, Rochelle. First I want to recognize we have a few people who have um, said hello to us um, on the Q&A. We've got Catherine with Maryland Legal Aid and Ed with Montana Legal Services. Um, we also have Kinsey and Rebecca in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So I have to give them a special hello because I went to uh, college in Bowling Green. So go tops. Um, it's nice to have all of you with us today. Um, and again, I do encourage everyone to submit your questions to us either through Twitter or through um, the Google Hangout Q&A app. So getting back to the Record Clearance Project though, Rochelle, I want to ask you what exactly can the students do in those, you know, those four components that Peggy laid out for us? What can the students do um, in this project? The students are actually a very vital part of the program. So they act they have the role of paralegals um, when they do the analysis of the client's criminal history report to determine um, eligibility for expungement and also to identify legal remedies for the client. During court petition preparation, they also draft attachments for the petitions as well as do additional legal research for case law or statutes that may be applicable to the client's case. All these are under the supervision of an attorney. The students, just by spreading the word about expungement law during our community education presentations, whether in community centers or in jail, also act as advocates in these presentations. They, they educate the public about expungement law, particularly in California. Also during um, client interviews through active listening and sensitivity, um, the students not only act as paralegal but also as social workers as client reveal the details of probably the darkest and most embarrassing moments of their lives and their struggles to get to their turning points. I know that um, in reading Peggy's article, which I encourage everyone to do, and, and I want to go ahead and remind you now that um, after the Hangout, we will send an email to everyone who registered. And it'll have a link to watch this recording again um, if you want to or if you missed it the first time, if someone missed it. Um, but also uh, a link to her article, and I encourage everyone to read it. And then one thing that she mentioned in the article is that one of the training parts for the students that's really the most important is learning how to interview clients. Because as you've said, this is such a um, the really intense uh, thing to talk about, often one of the worst parts of someone's lives. So is that, is that a challenge to learn how to do that, Rochelle? The students actually go through one semester of learning not just um, the law about expungement, but also how to deal with, to do client interviews in a professional and 
happens one semester, actuations, client interviews particularly. And um, imagine a two semester internship. So it's very intense and um, from let's say a class of 35, only 10 students can go on to the next part which is the representation part which is the second semester. So we go through a lot of training. Peggy, uh, we also during the first semester we do hands-on experience by going to the jail and doing community presentations there. In just one semester, a student can learn so much about not just the law, but in dealing with people and understanding how the, the whole system, from corrections to the court. Aside from that, we also do, I'm not sure if we mentioned, uh, moot courts for our clients that the students can participate in. So that, that helps the clients prepare before they actually go into court to have their, yes. lets them get a sense of what the courtroom's like and what it will be like for them. See. Um, Peggy, I wanted to ask you one thing. That you, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Rochelle. Oh, no. To, um, to be beside their client, to support uh, moral support, and also to give feedback. So we prepare clients for questions that the judge may ask, and also to boost the client's confidence. Right. I'm sure. I'm sure that, that um, does help. Uh, I want to ask you something, Peggy. In your article, you know, you lay out what some of these advantages are to having a criminal record expunge, which uh, most of our viewers may already be well acquainted with those, but just in case, you know, it, having a record can affect your ability to get housing, to get employment, um, to get education, all the things that are necessary really to rebuild after um, having a, an incident with the criminal justice system. Um, so I wonder what you have seen with your clients. What are some of the things you've seen happen after they've gone through um, your representation and your services? Well, it's extremely gratifying to um, be able to do this work, I, I must say. Um, in um, the, I think in the article I mentioned the frequency of tears in these types of cases and interviews is the highest that I've seen across a relatively broad practice of legal services work. So there's the psychological um, weight that has been lifted and I think with that psychological weight it, it allows people to become the people that um, they were meant to be as one client has said. So many of our clients are um, people who are interested in going into the caring professions and I think it's probably a reflection of so many of our clients having had um, very difficult childhoods. Uh, we have lots of clients who want to be nurses. Um, we have lots of clients who want to do child care, elder care, um, lots of clients who want to be alcohol and drug counselors. And any time there is a licensing requirement or any time that background checks get run, in particular working with um, the elderly, the disabled, and, and children, the criminal records will come up. And what we're able to do through the Record Clearance Project is um, clear, those, clear those barriers. So people are then able to continue with the internship that may be required, uh, such as a practicum for nursing or a practicum for uh, taking care of kids, they're able to finish their education and go into the field. So we've had a number of, of nurses come out of the program. Uh, again, a, a lot of people in the caring professions. And um, it's, it, it, we've also had that, it, not, just the, not just the benefits uh, described sort of anecdotally, uh, we've also had the benefits quantified. There was a study that was done by the Stanford Public Policy uh, school program and they analyzed our database. Uh, this is cited in the article but found using the data from the from the record clearance project clients that there was an income boost of about $6,190 following expungement per year and of course that keeps going and going. So um, there's a huge economic benefit and the Stanford study also analyzed the money that comes back into communities by increased payment of taxes and decreased reliance on public assistance so that the communities benefit as well. Um, we did a survey of our clients and 90% of people report that their records have made them underemployed, that's either unemployed or unable to move forward in their occupation because of the record. 
So lifting these barriers and creating um, the opportunity that exists in law for people to move forward, it just it feels like a profound, a profound change in lives. And indeed, that's what our, our clients tell us. Let me just mention a couple things that um, Amanda has agreed to, to do for uh, the people who have registered for this. And that is, there's a link of um, a couple of videos and a photo collage where our clients describe for themselves what some of the benefits of, of having the records cleared are. So we, in one of those, we, there's a two minute video where we posted a camera outside the courthouse uh, or outside the courtroom right after people came out and had their records cleared. And the comments that people have said just immediately right after even before they were able to get the next job or whatever, I, I think are pretty telling. At the end, one of the clients says that um, you gave me my life back. Um, that's a pretty amazing thing for undergraduates to hear. <laughs> Another man says that now all the pieces of my life are together. Um, those kinds of things by providing a legal remedy that exists for people and giving them the opportunity to take advantage of that, uh, it's, it, it feels like just amazing and humbling work. Let me mention the photo collage too that Rochelle put together. You were talking about the practice of interviewing. We do mock interviews and we critique the students in their mock interviews. So along with the list that's going to come around is a, a one minute photo collage of uh, students last semester who were practicing and, and being critiqued in their, in their mock interviews. So they do get practice with um, some of the real life scenarios that our clients have presented to our students. And, um, Fortunately, from the client evaluations, as you can tell, we, we ask for a lot of data and numbers, but fortunately from those, uh, we have a 100% success rate in people receiving the students receiving the highest rating on uh, a, the question that my student treated me with uh, courtesy. Well, that's great. That's really good to hear. Um, Peggy, I want to tell you just before the next time uh, you answer a question, you're microphone was kind of cutting in and out, so I don't know if there's anything you can do about it. It may not be, but I can still hear you the whole time, but I just thought I would um, mention. Okay. We've had a couple of questions come in, and one of those follows on what you were just telling us, Peggy, about, um, you know, what the, as far as what the students have learned that has allowed them to, you know, interact with the clients in such a way that you've had that wonderful success rate. Um, Jessica from Vermont has asked if you all can share the training materials with everyone. Um, so would that be something you would be able to do? Absolutely. I'd be delighted to do that. They're quite extensive. So um, if people want to just send me an email, uh, that would that would be great. I'd be happy to send it to them and I can explain a little bit more what the pieces of them are. But um, it's uh, last I counted, I think it's about 500 pages, but I can, I can uh, <laughs> say, say what's there. <laughs> And what and, and highlight what might be useful, but no, I'd be delighted to share those materials. Absolutely. Okay, great. All right, I was going to offer that we could attach them to the email we send out, but that may be a bit much. So what we'll do <laughs> instead is um, Jessica and anyone else who's interested, keep a keep an eye out for that email that will be coming to you. It'll probably be early next week with all the links, and um, I'll we'll make a point to include um, Peggy and Rochelle's email addresses in that, so they. Um, you can get in touch with them directly to get their materials and they can sort of tell you what it all is. Um, we've had one other question. No, oh, actually we have a couple more. Um, and this one is a little bit more about policy work, which I didn't hear that that's something that you all do, but I'll go ahead and ask you the question just because you may be able to um, point the um, or ask her in the right direction. This is Ed from Montana. He says, he asks if anyone has worked on expanding opportunities for clearing records. He says in Montana they have very limited statutory rights for clearing or sealing records and a state Supreme Court case saying there's no right to clear or seal a record outside the statutes. So, um, you know, you said you have pretty good laws on this front in California. Do you have any advice for Ed or people in other states who may not have those, um, the benefit of that? Yeah, um, and, and I should say that there's there are definitely legislative changes. So our our laws are good, relatively speaking. <laughs> um, there's lots of room to improve them. Uh, we there are some outstanding uh, community advocacy groups. We just haven't been able ourselves to do the policy work. Although having a detailed database in terms of the people that we have assisted and the needs that they've expressed has been helpful. I think in moving policy forward. 
Um, some bigger offices have been able to do that. So in California, the East Bay Community Law Center has been terrific. The National Employment Law Project is really where I would suggest that Ed uh, get in touch with because they have done an extraordinary job of um, moving legislation forward and, and promoting resources. There are also, uh, so, and NELP is in touch with, with lots and lots of other groups that are, are doing similar work. That's the National Employment Law Project at NELP.org. Um, they're also, uh, the ACLU has been very active the, here. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights has been very active here. And community-based groups, uh, all of us are none, based in San Francisco. It's a program of legal services for prisoners with children. And I should write this down because I can include those contacts as well for, um, in the list of materials that we send. But indeed, um, even I must say that even the most conservative legislators. Well, we've had some national spokespeople, right? I think Rand Paul and and was it John McCain? I'm not sure who, but, but um, recognize that uh, that the the truth of the quote that the article starts with, which is basically that. Um, the court in Green in 1975 saying we cannot conceive of any business necessity that would automatically place every individual convicted of any offense in the permanent ranks of the unemployed. So the the broad policy implications and the importance of um, getting people back to work, into housing, uh, able to get student loans, able to become foster parents, um, I just, it, it would be a, a really great thing, I think, to expand the expungement remedies in Montana and elsewhere where there's more room for, for development. Right, and you know, speaking of the kind of um, unexpected bedfellows, odd bedfellows, um, I think the Koch brothers even recently have come out saying that, you know, our criminal justice system is putting too many people in jail and too many people are coming out with records that then are an impediment to employment. Um, so yeah, there are some, I mean, the tide may be turning on this front. Um, so thank you, Ed, that's a, a great question. Um, we have one other question that has come in. Um, this is from um, Kenzie and Rebecca who are in Bowling Green. Um, they say they work for Barron River Area Safe Space Domestic Violence Shelter. Um, they want to know what steps they would should take to assist their clients who may have assault charges that would prevent them from using their field licenses. Um, so it may be another case of uh, who they would need to get in touch with, I guess, um, in their area. I don't know. Or do you have any advice on that front? You know, there's a NELP maintains a national list serve, so I would check in with NELP. I don't offhand know folks in in that area. Um, there's also um, well, that would be that would be probably my best my best suggestion. Um, in California, the type of charge other than sex offenses is is relatively, well, pretty much irrelevant legally. So um, in California, the law says that if people successfully complete probation on most jail sentences other than sex offenses, those convictions generally have to be dismissed. So we find a lot of folks who find themselves in domestic violence situations and um, are able to have those convictions dismissed and again can move forward with their lives. Okay, thank you. Um, our time is actually coming close to an end, but before we go, I, I really want to talk to Rochelle about the student perspective on this. Peggy mentioned um, in one of her recent answers about uh, hearing a client say, you gave me my life back and how just amazing that must be for well anyone, any attorney to hear that, but especially an undergraduate. And so I want to ask you, Rochelle, what is it, how does this change students who go through this program if it does? It really impacts a student so much. We have realized that we live before it was just a theory for us. We're usually so a uh, justice studies major, right? But our experience with RCP allowed us to bear witness to how we criminalize the poor. And um, with RCP, poor people now have names. They have histories. They have stories. They have families. And they have a future. So um, the negative social identity of having a criminal record, we now realize
does is first to stop that cycle and give a helping hand. And a lot of my colleagues or classmates have, after our experience with RCP, would either like to go to social service types of profession, or most most of us are actually going to law school like me to serve the people our, like our clients in RCP. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, that's a real testament to what you're doing because you know sometimes students um, have an experience with legal practice and say no thanks. So I think it's a real testament to what you're doing that it's you see so so much real positive change come from it that it's um, inspiring enough to want to pursue it as a as a career. Um, Peggy, I wanted to ask you, we have a lot of our viewers today who are at legal services programs. I'm, you know, I, I'm just sort of guessing here. I'm wondering how many of them are already doing this type of practice and how many are interested in maybe what they can do in this realm. So I wanted to ask you um, about starting an expungement practice. And, you know, I don't know if you want to share with us how the record clearance project started or if you just have tips on what others would need to do in their programs if they wanted to start doing some criminal records representation. Yeah, I would strongly recommend uh, starting a legal services practice if in expungement if if folks already don't have one going. And and yes, a shout out to the to the wonderful folks who've done this through legal services offices because it is responding to an enormous community need. And we just I don't think at least I personally had not recognized how broad that need was. There is funding available and some of the links that Amanda is going to be sending around to folks include a list of Department of Justice grants, a, a list of Department of Labor grants that are available and then of course states have, have potential funding sources as well. Um, I, I think that the idea of starting to work in in this area, I, I guess I would just recommend starting slow because it's easy to be overwhelmed uh, and always listening to the clients in terms of what assistance needs to be provided. So um, in any way I could be of assistance in facilitating people getting started, I would be delighted to do that. And um, I, I, again, I, I think the rewards of this kind of program are astonishing. Um, is an understatement. It's life-changing for everybody involved. Well, yes, so as you say, um, the resources that Peggy will be sending, we will uh, just remind you, we'll be sending out an email likely early next week that will have that links to information in it. It will link to Peggy's great article on expungement as a gateway to work um, and to a recording of this Hangout, um, along with their email addresses so you can get in touch with them for the um, training materials they use at the Record Clearance Project. Um, we've actually reached the end of our half hour. This always goes so quickly. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us. I also want to invite you to tune in for next month's um, Hangout on Air. Um, I'm seeing we're still getting questions. <laughs> well, thank you, um, Catherine, for your question. I'm sorry we didn't get um, a chance to answer it. Um, I do want to invite everyone. We'll have uh, another Hangout next month. Um, we will be talking next month with Spring Miller and Stacy Jonas. They both um, are attorneys who have worked with the Texas Rio Grande Legal Aids. Um, let me get the name of it exactly right. Their human trafficking team. Um, and they authored our, art our Clearinghouse article for May, um, which is on using anti-trafficking laws um, to advance workers' rights. So we'll be speaking with them. That hangout will be on Wednesday, May 20th, and it will be at the same time as this one, which was noon central time. Um, We'll have the article up on the Clearinghouse community uh, next week. So, and you'll be getting an email. If, since you registered for this one, you'll get an email about that Hangout, so you can um, tune in for that one. We hope you'll join us. One other thing I want to say is that next week is the Equal Justice Conference in Austin, Texas, and I will be there. And so any of you watching or if you have colleagues who will be there, uh, please send me a note. Let me know. I'd love to get together and say hi and um, get your ideas for things that we could cover in our articles or our Hangouts and just um, generally meet you, so um, send me a note if you'll be there. Um, I want to thank our guests once again. This has been really interesting. I really appreciate your time uh, with us today, so thanks again, Peggy. Thank you so much. And thank you, Rochelle. Thank you. Don't forget to check out our Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it Record Clearance Project? Is it pretty easy to find? I guess we could also link to that in the email, too. Um, 
we can make a point to include that too so people can find you on social media. All right, and thank you to all of you who have tuned in. Um, I do hope you'll join us again next month. And um, until then, we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.